Welcome to Arts for the Health of It, a podcast where you will discover creative ways to improve your health and well-being. Someone may have told you that art isn't for you, but they were wrong. Anyone can create arts for the health of it. No talent or experience necessary. I'm just a little songbird. Try to fly my way homeward with the melody And I make the beat Don't know where it'll take me, take me Cause when I'm in the dark of night I sing my way back to the light Come along with me and your heart will see That a song changes everything Oh Friends, welcome to I'm Arts for the Health of It. I'm your host, Richard Wilmore. And I'm your co-host, Constanza Rader. Is anyone else feeling like a little bit frayed at the edges? Um, well, it's actually a fairly common experience that when people, when humans go through traumatic experiences, we kind of have to do whatever we need to do to compartmentalize and survive the traumatic experience. And then you can deal with all the emotional and Tr- junk, all the aftermath, once you are a little bit more safe. And this last year and a half has been a traumatic experience for pretty much everyone in the world. And I think everyone is starting to feel the strain of that. And now that we're coming through some of the more intense parts of the pandemic and things are s- creeping back to normal we're probably gonna, you're probably gonna start feeling more of that, um, that unresolved junk kind of bubbling up to the surface. And like, what do you do with that? And what is that? And how do we, how do we cope with that? Well, we got to talk with um, one of my heroes actually today, which is so cool. I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of you that you, uh, I don't know. I was going to bring continue. it up a couple times, but that you were very poised during the oh, interview. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, that there was no crying or stuttering <laughs> or fan, like there wasn't a lot of gushing. I can take myself. Talking to Dr. Kathy Melchiotti. Yes. Oh, she's so wonderful. She has amazing books out about expressive arts therapies. She's a trainer um, of trauma-informed practice and expressive arts therapies. Um, She has written so many articles. You can just Google her and you can find a ton of articles. Um, And she's just was amazing to talk about, talk to and was a wealth of information. And she shares some really good practical stuff about how trauma affects us, how we can use expression. She's very careful to distinct to you to distinct between creativity and expression because some people are intimidated by creativity or like there's some pressure maybe around that word but anyone can like express like there's no judgment around that like you just express uh it was very cool i really and the word of the day is move move so uh you should count how many times we say move movement move move and you could make like some sort of game out of it. I don't know. Yeah. Every time she says Maybe it, you have to move. clap. You oh, have to there you go. do a paint a brush stroke every time <laughs> she says move. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what I was going to tell her, but then we ran out of time was I booked Kathy. And then 20 <laughs> minutes later, like I did the whole like Google calendar or whatever. And 20 minutes later, I get a call from Stanzi that was like, how did you get her? And I was like... <laughs> Who like no, she didn't even like say her name, and she was like Kathy. How did you get her? Like in this like boy. Oh, and I'm like I don't. I emailed her. Why? Like what's? And she said yes. And she was like she's my hero. And I was like oh my god. All right. I, I think like, that's one of the best. I mean, I think I've said that about as many of our, I mean, all of our guests are yes. amazing and are not all now my heroes, even if I didn't know about them before they are now. Um, but yeah, I, I followed Kathy and read a lot of her stuff and followed her for a long time. So it's really cool to get to meet her. Yes. I thought it was going to be one of those interviews where it's just, <laughs> it's just you. me gushing the whole time. Yes. 
Ah, well, I know how amazing well. she is. There was very important stuff we needed to cover. There was very important, and we did cover it in this yeah. episode. Um, she, Dr. Kathy Melchiotti, holds a doctorate in psychology with a spe- specialization in research and health psychology, and is a clinical mental health counselor, expressive arts therapist, an art therapist who has spent over 30 years working with individuals with traumatic stress and studying how the arts support reparation, integration, and recovery from trauma. She's also the founder and executive director of the Trauma-Informed Practices and Expressive Arts Therapy Institute. I'm telling you, people in the arts and health world love long titles. Yes, I, well, it's difficult a, to explain what we do. It's true. And uh, that the Institute trains mental health and health care practitioners in medical, educational, and community settings and assists in disaster relief and humanitarian efforts throughout the world. So... Um, I can't believe she even had time to sit down with us, but we're very thankful that she did. And it's a great episode. So take a look and make sure you uh, subscribe wherever you're listening or watching to this episode. Here's Dr. Kathy Melchiotti. Enjoy. We are here with Dr. Kathy Melchiotti. I said that correctly, yes? Yes, of course. Her next appearance will be um, all about name pronunciations. She's going to come back. (laughs) Yes. Um, But I kind of want to start off, if you're listening to this on iTunes or whatever podcast platform, jump on our YouTube channel because you have some really amazing art behind you, textiles behind you. And that's really where I want to start is what's happening behind you. What's happening behind me? We were talking before we started about everyone's now filming in their bedrooms and their living rooms <laughs> and converting spaces into TV studios. And I want to know what yours looks like. Well, first, I want you to have something nice to look at if you have to stare at me for any <laughs> length of time. But actually, you know, these are all different fabrics that I picked up from around the world because mm. before the pandemic, I got to travel like a lot of other people. I had a wonderful, uh, you know, freedom to go places and this all stopped for this past year. Uh, You know, but these are from Singapore, uh, Spain, uh, I'm trying to think where else, Canada. uh, And and now that I can't wear them, I thought just put them up here as a colorful background for people to see because I've been on literally 147 different online platforms since last April. Oof. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the, actually the story of that. And there's a, a gratitude scroll there actually that I made that has to do with travel. Uh, a lot of the travels that I took to China, I was in China right before the pandemic. Wow. And it probably was already happening uh, when I was there. So, uh, but I've been grateful to go to Asia at least six times. So that's a scroll that, you know, because I create art. So I created some art around that with some of the things that I collected over the years from going over to Asia and go, going into China, mainland China for the most part. Yeah. So that's kind of the story. And the screen is there to also not see my messy bookshelf in that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Doesn't Create everyone have one? <laughs> Create a diversion. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for giving us yeah. the little tour. Um, can so you are one of the forefront speakers and researchers in the field of um uh, art therapy and the intersection of trauma and art art therapy and the use of arts in trauma recovery. And we're so excited to have you here to talk. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit about your story and your background and what led you to this path. Yeah. Um, and, and I want to qualify that a little bit. Oh, yes. Please correct anything I just no, no, said. <laughs> it's not, not a huge mistake, but I, as I traveled on this pathway of using the arts with people who are challenged by distress, by traumatic stress in particular, I evolved from starting out as a visual artist decades ago, going to a traditional fine arts school in Boston, uh, School of the Museum of Fine Arts, and was a studio artist for a long time. But I never really felt comfortable in that isolation. I really, and I also Mm. felt like what my art did for me was something beyond just creating something for somebody to look at, right? There Mm. was something happening. It was transformative in some way and and personally healing. And I I don't Mm. think I was the only one, you know, to ever have that thought. I'm sure some of my classmates actually did have those experiences too. But I 
started to move off from that into art education and doing classroom teaching and then ran into this uh, graduate program literally in the near the community that I lived in then that was a master's in art therapy so that mm -hmm. you know that made I didn't even know what it was but it made sense I thought mm -hmm. like, that, that sounds like what I want to do and uh, yeah so and at that point we didn't know much about how the arts really functioned in healing capacities so the program was good, but it was slim on in information at that point because that's several decades ago. Now we have all this brain science and understanding of the body and how we respond to distress and how arts can be uh, reparative and restorative to people. But what I wanted to say was I now I, over the last 10 to 15 years, think of the work as expressive arts therapy. And expressive mm -hmm. arts therapy is what we call multimodal or integrative because it involves all the arts. And what I found in working with people with traumatic stress, and I learned a lot of this from working with military. So working with adults, whose listeners might be thinking right now, that must be great with children, right? It is, <laughs> mm -hmm. it is. I mean, you know, because there's play and enlivenment in the arts, but this is a very powerful thing with adults and in the military have very much embraced it. There are so many different, I would call them arts and medicine, arts and healthcare programs around the United States now, even run by, motivated by military. But they taught me really that they needed to do a lot of things that were active. So, you know, art is more of a sit down, contemplative, create, go inside yourself, helps to regulate and calm the body. You tell stories through it, you produce something that people can respond to, you know, and you can hear their responses. But I learned in working with traumatic stress, people also need to engage all the senses. They need mm -hmm. to be able to move. That's one of the biggest things is to just move. Because if you get stuck in your body with the trauma, uh, that is not helpful when we're thinking about trying to be preventative with things like PTS, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I started to really learn from them and take myself back into some of the early things that I did as an art student, which were studying performance art, studying movement, um, studying drama, some of those kinds of things, and also music to mm -hmm kind of expand all that because the person that's in front of you is the most important. So I could have just stuck with the visual art, but I, my, my sense was, and I think, I, I think I'm on the right path that people need to have a variety of senses engaged and then they mm -hmm. find one that really resonates with them. So that was a really long answer. I'm sorry if I went. No, that's, that <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you for all those points of clarification. Yeah. Because there's a little bit of difference between art, therapy is the visual art right so you know and i know in your area where you're uh, situated there are art therapists there but mm -hmm. there are less expressive arts therapists but it's becoming a thing uh, mm -hmm. because i think with all the trauma and now that we're moving out of the pandemic that word move we need to get moving mm -hmm. we you know a lot of people have been making art during the pandemic as a way of calming down because the anxiety levels are quite high right now but that those other senses and to get together with people now as we're moving through this post pandemic phase hopefully to be in synchrony and in rhythm with other people which is another powerful thing about the arts when you get together and sing or drum or move mm. together we've been hungry for that a lot of us you know a lot of us have been in isolation so um, I think it's starting to take hold in a bigger way because of the pandemic that mm. people are sensing and this multiple characteristics and qualities of expressive arts. There's something there that we need and it's always been there. I, you have you mentioned a little bit, you've kind of touched on some of this, but I'd love for you to dive a little bit deeper into how trauma affects us. Um, you mentioned our bodies. A lot of times we think of how trauma affects our minds, but I think, you know, that that somatic element is really <laughs> important. Um, and then like, and then how the arts can, can help with that. 
Yeah, you know, trauma affects everyone differently. So if you and I, we all went through the same bad thing, you know, something that was disturbing. We'd be distressed in different ways, likely. Uh, some of us, we just get really anxious and either want to fight or, or flee, you know, but we, we're motivated to move. But a lot of people in a, you know, exposed to a serious event, uh, their bodies get frozen. They start to, to survive. It's not a bad thing in the moment because you need to, what they call dissociate from what's going on. So that dissociation uh, numbs your body. So, you know, you don't have that sensation of that rapid heart rate. You don't even notice if your heart rate's going quickly, if you're breathing heavily, because you dissociate from those reactions. So that is another reaction uh, that some people have, and some people have both. You know, some people are over anxious, we call it hyperarousal, and they also dissociate at times. So we can have any combination of all that. Uh, and But the thing I think about the expressive arts, one of the things I want people to move towards eventually is feeling their bodies come alive in a positive way. And I think, you know, it's interesting because you can, because you can have someone go to a talk therapist and I've certainly learned a lot of those skills because I have a, a PhD in psychology and you learn all the talk, ways <laughs> of talking to people, but talking doesn't affect the body. It affects the brain. Mm -hmm. So when we get, give people the chance to do something action oriented, playful and imaginative, it starts to change the sensations in the body. And one of the sensations I think about a lot with people, um, and you even see this in the military and they struggle with it a lot, is a sensation of fear. Now it might be just fear of how their symptoms control them or fear that they're going to get angry and hurt one of their family members or a friend because their anger is so powerful. But if you have curiosity and playfulness, the fear can't exist with that. In that moment, fear is not present. So there, there's some really interesting things that are pretty different than talk therapy, which intends to change your thoughts, educate you on what's going on, help you identify resources, which are all things that we need to do with people who are traumatized. But the arts take it to this other level of re-engaging the body in pleasure and joy and all these things that start to replace those horrible feelings that people have, those horrible sensations, because you can't just get rid of them and have nothing to put mm -hmm. in there. So this is the thing I think is remarkable about this work. So maybe if, if I'm understanding you right, the maybe traditional therapies might focus on getting rid of bad feelings, but if you're not replacing those with positive sensations, yeah. It, then I, yeah. you leave a vacuum. I think, um, in, I don't know if it's a vacuum. I don't know how to describe that. But I think if you're really truly going to repair and restore the self, the body has to feel, the mind and body have to feel good again in some way. They have to mm. feel, it has to feel good about something, whether it's an it or a they. Uh, you, your body uh, has had this, stress for you know, a lot of people for their entire lifetimes you know so, some of them have had that stress since they were children how do we reintroduce all the wonderful things that the body can engage in and feel good about um, after you know somebody has been through these terrible events and it has impacted them in this way of anxiety of depression of dissociation and they've lost joy Mm. and getting up every day because every day is a struggle of survival with those emotions and those reactions. Mm. So I think that's the thing. There's, I don't know if it's a vacuum, but it's, it's, if you don't have something to put in its place, then maybe it is a vacuum. Maybe it is, you know, it's an empty space mm. that, you know, okay, I don't have those terrible thoughts anymore, mm. but I don't feel quite right yet. <laughs> mm. you know, and I hear people say that a lot. They've been to really good talk therapists and had a lot of um, good experiences, but they come to this kind of um, an approach because they intuitively think, hmm, maybe there's something that I, I couldn't express in words and, and I need to express that. But then they start to find out, 
wow, this process is kind of interesting. I'm moving, I'm drumming, I'm, you know, I'm doing these things. They eventually, I don't see, I don't, I haven't used the word creative yet. And I don't often say to people or, or introduce things. There are people out there, let me back up, that are called creative arts therapists. So those are art therapists, music therapists, dance therapists, drama therapists. And then there's a, a kind of a more uh, vague, definition for poetry therapy or creative writing kind of falls into another category. Those are all these separate creative arts therapies. That's why I like the term expressive. Most people feel uncomfortable with that creative word. Mm. You know, imagine the average uh, military. <laughs> and I've, I've worked with the Navy SEALs and Army <laughs> and coming and saying, I was told by one of my friends or, or the doctor that this might be helpful and I like the idea that you don't make people talk, that you have people do things, but I'm not creative. Mm -hmm. We all say that. There's, and I say, I came from an art background. There's a lot of days I wake up, I'm not creative. I know I'm not <laughs> going to be creative, <laughs> but we all can be expressive, you mm. know, and you're going to find out that there's very easy things. There's gesture, very simple gesture or a gesture of a mark on the paper that's expressive. And we'll start with that. It's like anything else. We have to develop a language. And then we'll see, you know, down the road. Is there a moment that you think, huh, I think I, I did something really creative today because it's personal too, you know, that what creative is. So that, that to me is another piece of all this that people learn that they can be expressive in another way without the words, but the words come from that too. It stimulates mm. the words. It stimulates the story. Mm. So cool. I can't remember what our question was. I no, went just, off It doesn't matter. This <laughs> is all good. <laughs> we're all just sitting here well, listening. Like, I know. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> yeah, it's all interconnected. That's what's hard. And when I said about the expressive arts being integrative, I think even the discussion about it is circular. You know, it mm -hmm. all. I think, you, you know, if you, you understand the arts, you know that, that the arts are... Um, they're, they're very hard to define, and that's wonderful about them, too, that, that we have to really kind of go around in a lot of different dimensions to grasp that. And then what we really need to be doing is when you're engaged in it, you know what it is. It, it's the talk about it that's hard. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> You've talked a lot about uh, working with the military, and I have a mm -hmm. couple of questions about that. But I want to take a break quickly and then come back and talk about the other populations that you have worked with and sort of how you work with them. And is it, is it just one model for everything or are you kind or do you have to form what you're doing based obviously on your population, which I think I know the answer to, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to pretend that I don't know. So we'll be, right, know, yeah. <laughs> we'll be uh, right back right after this quick break. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at the power of music in our everyday lives through the lens of science and health, sports and entertainment, business and education. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. Unleash the power of music. Doing telehealth is, you know, when you're talking to the person, you're looking up at the camera <clears throat> you know, and, and making sure that you're engaged, even though you can't see them because you're looking up at the camera. I mean, it's absolutely a weird skill that you have to learn <laughs> because the attunement with the person is everything. So, mm. yeah. We're, wow. we're, that is also a question. Were you doing anything virtual before this? Because, I mean, you said you were on 147 different things in this year like is that completely new for you or was that part oh of the the zoom part yeah because yeah. they always wanted you to come live you know and and teach and and do workshops or speak in a hotel ballroom or whatever and that you know and what what do you love and what do you hate about that virtual world in your um world? I don't know yet I think you know when I get back out there I'll start to know what it is yeah. <laughs> but um 
you know, I, I did some telehealth work before people actually, actually had to do telehealth therapy. So what happened, I don't know, you know, I have to think back here now to March of 2020. There was a weekend, literally, that all psychotherapists, people that did work, went to a place, worked with people uh, that had various emotional or traumatic challenges or whatever. Um, they had to overnight become telehealth therapists. I mean, at least I had had a little bit of that experience because the military, sometimes they're here, but then they move someplace and they want to continue to see you. So mm -hmm. I had a little bit of experience with that. But of course, then after that, it turned into all uh, telehealth. And I was glad that I had experience live expressive arts because you do things that are more active. I, you mm -hmm. know, to have somebody sit here and, and draw <laughs> on the other, you know, they'd be as maybe they would enjoy it. But how do I use that hour to engage, and especially when socialization had been limited, how to use the hour to really mm. be in social engagement with people. So it mm. meant doing things together. Uh, you know, if, if they had to drum on their desk with me while I drummed, you can see a drum back there, I think. Mm -hmm. If I had put on a wizard hat to get their attention, I put on that wizard hat. <laughs> a lot of hats, yeah. Yes. I mean, just to surprise somebody coming on, get their intention right away so that we could engage and do things together. And so, see, this is where, for me, the visual art piece kind of fell out of the way. And they could do that in between sessions. Um, but for me to just sit here and not be engaging with them, I needed to engage in rhythm and movement and sound and you know, all that kind of play that, that really set up that relational piece. Mm. Well, you that know. makes me think of Richard's question before the break about engaging different populations and how you might need to engage mm -hmm. them differently. Like, would mm -hmm. you approach a military, I imagine you might need to approach a military veteran differently from maybe a cancer survivor yeah. differently. And I'm curious about that about that process. So yeah, I mean, it does depend on the person, but there are some things that are, I wouldn't say standard, but it's a universal way to think about the expressive arts. Now, in most cases with using the arts, my philosophy is we try to start from what we call a bottom up approach. So the bottom up approach is more rhythm and movement and sounds, very sensory, engaging the senses and feeling that in your body and not analyzing it or, you know, using it to generate talk. If talk comes up, that's fine, but more getting into the body in that way. And then some people are not comfortable with that for various reasons. I mean, their bodies may be overcharged and overactive or they've been so dissociated for so long from their body, they're not there yet. Mm. So some people, it's important to start with what I call a top down and top down starts with a narrative. So, you know, and engage in creative writing uh, and narrative, more language based kind of things, storytelling. And, you know, to some extent, actually, the visual art functions more in that area of creating an image and talking about that image. So, you know, just I have to feel that out with people to find out where that would be an appropriate thing. So here's an example that's not military. So if you have, and I've run into this a lot in the medical system, parents who have a child who's very... Uh, compromised by maybe cancer or some very serious medical treatment and they are doing everything they can to hang on you know they have to stay uh they're maintaining their cognitive level more than they don't want to dip into emotions and sensations so we start more with that higher level because it helps support where they're at because they need to be there for that child they will need the other work they need to find out what they're feeling and be able to express that at some point. But to have them go into that in that moment is often not appropriate, so that they mm. need to stay more up here <laughs> rather than mm. down here. Uh, so, you know, that's what I like about this, because you can think about, you know, and find out from people what they're more comfortable with. If they're more comfortable with the writing and journaling and that kind of thing, or if they're ready to move and that's comfortable for them, or if they want to start to move but sit in the chair and move and, mm. and and do things in a limited way. I have people like that. They they have to work towards standing up. That's mm. okay. 
you know, because they don't, they might feel more vulnerable or, uh, you know, it's just too intimidating for them. So that's what I think about basically, but I want to get through all those things somehow in the times that we meet over, over time. So the senses in the body, the emotional level, and what's going on up in the mm -hmm. head, what's going on with the thoughts and, and that. And I think when we get repair in all three of those areas, I actually see people, you know, start to change. They, they come in, you can just tell the way they come into the room. You know, now I have to see the way they come into the Zoom, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to try to gauge that now given the different quality of, of telehealth, because not everybody, you, they don't appear the way you would see them in real life, but to see a bounce in their step when they would come back into the clinic. And I know something changed, you know, the, but mm -hmm. I think all those three areas start to come together. People have a, a repair in each of those areas. And that's mm -hmm. the thing. See, if you're doing talk therapy, you're dealing with what's up here. That's it. Mm -hmm. You're not really getting the rest of the person engaged as easily. You could talk them through a little bit of this, but you're never going to get there unless they do that other kind of communication and engage the body and engage that expression. So those three areas, again, let me make sure I get it straight. So it's the, the cognitive or the mind mm -hmm. and the body and then the emotions. Are those yeah. the three? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the emotions kind of the in between, you know, because the sensations in the body create the emotions a lot of time, you know. So if you're, you know, your heart rate's accelerated, you're often in an anxious place, hmm. uh, or it's a painful place. It can be very painful too. Um, yeah, yeah. And, so, and it seems like is that kind of a common experience? It seems like that from my experience working with a lot of cancer patients and being a survivor myself that it seems like there's each person kind of has like a default mode that they go to, to oh, yeah. we get all do. through yeah. the trauma mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they you deal with the unraveling <laughs> all the other levels yep. after mm -hmm. and I feel like this is maybe a common experience that people might be experiencing now is we experienced collective trauma in the pandemic mm -hmm. and now things are starting to slowly roll back to normal might we expect to see like maybe a mental health crisis of okay oh, now I think we're seeing it, are, yeah, we're we're seeing seeing it already, already right yeah because yeah. i think i don't i don't know about you i'll just i'll just be transparent here i have moments sometimes and they're very fleeting where i think i don't feel quite right you know mm -hmm. and or I, I feel like i have a brain fog all of a sudden, you know, is something along those lines. And that's just personal for me. I hear other people talk about, I woke up in the middle of the night. I was so anxious and I was making to-do lists and I don't know why I'm not at work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had friends that have said that. And I said, I, I had that actually happen to me once. I woke up and I, I was thinking through all these things that needed to be done. And then I said to myself, I don't need to do that right now. I can go to sleep. How much coffee did I have today? Yeah, that's that was, <laughs> yeah. So I think we're seeing it already now. Uh, a couple things. One thing when you now go backwards now back a year ago, we were told, you know, depending on where you live, but, but here actually I live in Louisville, Kentucky. This was one of the first places with, with a governor who said, we have to stop things. We have to stop uh, the restaurants, the bars, uh, even the yoga studios, the hairdressers, all this, we're, we're shutting down. You know, he, he was one of the first ones. So we started that narrative of a mobilize, you know, because we were told then to, it was called social distancing at that point. And then people were starting to call it physical distancing. Both those terms got used, but you were not to, uh, get close to people. You were to isolate, stay in as much as possible. Even when your mail and packages came, wipe everything down, which now we know was not really necessary, but <laughs> that's what we were told. So we had, we were told to be stressed, you know, I mean, and a lot of us, maybe we didn't feel so, we didn't think we were stressed because we had social support, you know, we maybe had somebody we lived with or we had a pod of people that we could engage with, but all that's been going on in our back of our minds for a year. It really mm -hmm. has been because we keep getting the news of this, you know, and then the vaccination came out and, you know, what was that going to change things? I mean, we were only getting around to right now seeing a little bit of that 
relief, but we never mm. really processed all of what was going on for a mm. year. So I think we're all going to have a little something. Now, what I wanted to say to the second level of that is people that have had existing trauma, this has been tough for them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of them depended on social support and connection and that was removed. Uh, some of them were in the middle of, you know, being doing the work on themselves and then this layer was thrown on to, you know, unexpected, you know, uh, what they call a every hundred year event, hopefully. Um, and that, you know, if you have existing trauma, this has made it exponentially uh, more impossible in some ways. And they've had, they will have more work to do probably. Not everybody, but a lot of people that have had that in their history. Uh, and particularly mm. what's interesting too, back you know, a couple decades ago again, well, actually in the early 90s, I worked with people who had HIV and AIDS. And at that point, there were not good medications to save people's lives. That came a little bit later. Uh, so there were people in the community, a lot of people died from the disease. But the survivors, they're all talking now about what they went through with all the losses of friends and family during that time because this pandemic has triggered mm. that. Yeah. Wow. So I know a couple of people, I'm not seeing patients in that area, but I know a couple of people that I've talked to um, about that. And yeah, we, we have not really thought about that. I mean, some people that have been through similar events and that are similar to the pandemic and they're, they're one group that has, mm. they saw so many people die. Mm. Yeah. So there's that. And then there's the grief and loss. That's the third thing I was thinking about. We, we all are still in trying to tread water here. We're feeling that. I mean, we're human. We're mm -hmm. feeling that. And they say for each one of those people, at least nine people were personally affected, you know, loss mm. of friend or loved one or a workmate or somebody that really were important to them and died in this. Mm. So there's that collective grief as well, which is part of trauma as well in many ways. So what can, is there anything, any advice you offer to our listeners, um, things that they could maybe do either um, on their own or as they're able to get back with family and friends and reconnect? Um, are there tools from expressive arts that you might recommend for people to explore? Well, it's just like I said before about the writing. That would be a really good place. And there, there have been a lot of people during the pandemic keeping journals, just just doing it because they just thought, I, I need to write this down or I need to put this somewhere. And I, you know, a lot of people who have been really isolated seem to have gravitated towards that. So I thought, wow, that's the, the really um, amazing thing about expressive arts that humans actually do know to go to them. Mm. They have been here for thousands of years. This is nothing new. We've just now given it names, but it's always existed. There's basic practices. You know, when I talk to people that are coming either as patients or as students to the field, I say, you know, there is movement, there's sound, there's storytelling, and then there's silence. These are the four things that, Ooh, that, say that we again. have. Movement, you know, so gesture, movement, mm -hmm. that would also be dance. But if you think about the world, just think about the world, all the different dances that are mm -hmm. out there, right? Yeah. So there's Polynesian hula, there's Australian karaburi. I just learned recently on a wonderful Zoom with somebody from New Zealand how to do haka, which is oh. the New Zealand. It's, it's very powerful and you feel it in your body and you feel empowered and just the self-confidence comes from learning that. So, you know, so there's movement, then there's sound, which is music, but it's also the sound of our own voice. I know how we can use that in different ways. Uh, you know, so all that and listening um, and hopefully now going back and attending things oh, where we can hear yes. things together, Why right? Because we knew before this all started that getting together and listening to a concert, for example, we always thought like, okay, it's fun to go and you're with your friends and there's other people, but we entrain together. We're, again, we're humans that are connected. We're social beings. So they actually were starting to do a lot of measurements of that of the theater and concerts and performances, how people would entrain their heart rates together 
you know, and mm. entrain their breathing. So, you know, that connection is missing now, but that's, see, that intersects with that whole thing about going and listening together and being together to listen. Then storytelling is all the narrative and enactment, so theater, but also when people make art, they often, it triggers something about language. There's a mm. connection between image making stimulating language which is very interesting so i put that in that category so in storytelling of course is one of the things uh in all cultures people sit around and tell stories you know it's mm. for some cultures for thousands of years that's been a very healing process um mm. aboriginal culture in australia that's their go-to for a healing practice is is getting together gathering in the circle maybe they make some images but they tell stories and and to everybody to deeply listen to what's going on so that's that's an art form that's contemporary but it's been around you know for thousands of years then the silence piece you know a lot of what we do is can be very meditative it can be very contemplative so you know just sitting and painting you know, engaging in the arts in that way, or going again to be with people and just listening, chanting, doing those things can be very silencing for the body, gets you back into a nice rhythm within yourself. So um, yeah, those four things are the way I kind of explain it to people. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, you know, for a practice, then I always say, you know, if people are just starting out, the the journaling pieces are really i think especially at this time for some reason i think it's a very important thing and we know from studies that particularly with medical populations but with a lot of trauma populations too that just going and writing and not censoring yourself just let it go just write mm -hmm. it all out you don't even have to have anybody see it or read it again if you do that for a very short time period say two or three times a week for several weeks, you have a much less uh, incident of traumatic reactions than mm. people that don't do that. And they also learned when people had, there was a study on uh, chronic illnesses and one of the illnesses they studied were, were people with arthritis. So like rheumatoid arthritis, the form that uh, is quite chronic, their pain level, their pain perception went down wow. without an increase in medication just by doing the writing. Mm. So what I tell people too is if you feel comfortable, you could go either way with this. If you feel comfortable, maybe just doodling an image of how you feel today, you know, what you're feeling. And if it, you can't think of an image, just put a color on the paper and then do your writing. Or you can go the other way around. You can do some writing and then see what comes out of that and just kind of make it a word and visual journal together mm. to see, you know, just, just have fun with it. Nobody has to see it. You know, a lot of times people will bring that to the expressive arts session. But, you know, if, even if you never show it to anybody, it still has a powerful effect. Uh, those studies started to go on after um, September 11th, 2001, hmm. uh, when somebody decided, uh, James Pennebaker, he uh, did a lot of research on creative writing uh, and trauma and just got people to do this as a very simple practice. So you don't have to write a poem. You don't have to write a complete story. It can just be fragments of things, but to get that flowing out on the paper has some kind of cleansing effect on the mind and the body. Hmm. Yeah. Do you know uh, if there is a difference between like people who are typing writing or like using ooh, your hand question. to write? Do you know? That's a good question. See, Thank I you. think, yeah, no, I think that's, a, a, I don't know if somebody did the, did research on that. I thought about that once. I thought, you know, because I started out in the year of writing on a notepad to write books and articles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I still do. I still have, you know, if you saw what was around me, I have a lot of different, you know, things to write on. And I think the writing is different when you do that. It slows you down in a, in a way. And sometimes I have people, people could try this too, writing with your non-dominant hand. Ooh, yeah. It's a little bit of a struggle, but you get different information from that. And I, I don't know exactly how that works. Is it because we have to slow down and try to get that written down so that you, know, you can't go as quickly? Because you go to the keyboard, I'm not a great typist, amazingly. I've never <laughs> really the classic typing i have my own way of going about it but it's faster you know than than writing script 
Yeah. You know, I, I, I think there's something, because I suggest to people that they, if they want to do that, that's fine. But I think it's important to write it down. We've done that for centuries too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it must be a reason. Uh, it wasn't just because we didn't have computers. There was something else to that, to be mm -hmm. touching a surface with that. Well, if you know the answer to that, please contact yeah. us and come and um, be a guest <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> Kathy, what's the um, last creative thing you did for yourself? Oh, you know, I've gotten back into into my sketchbooks, which uh, partly because somebody's asked me to create graphics, but it's not like I have an assignment. I have to create a graphic with a certain meaning. I just go to the sketchbook and pick up color and what's going on with me and just put that out there on, on the page. And that's nice. To me, that's my visual journaling. I don't write about it, but it's, you know, it, it's, it probably comes from way back. This is what I did when I started out as an art student. Mm. Uh, and I'm more interested in kind of the movement of, you know, the colors, all those elements I talked about. I'm interested in all that. Sometimes when I look at what I do, I hear sound. Yeah, you know, so to me, it's all multidimensional. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I, Very cool. Yeah, but I also try. I have not been as good at it as I was before the pandemic, oddly enough. Dance oh. for 30 minutes a day. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think that's really important right now. That's the other thing people can, can do. I mean, put on the music that makes your body feel alive and just mm -hmm. move to that. Because that cannot hurt right now, given that we all may have some level of symptoms that we are going to come out of, but it's good to get the body moving. That's the first thing I always think about, because I think in the beginning when I started to work with trauma, it was with children who had been abused. They had witnessed domestic violence in their family. Mm -hmm. Some of them had been assaulted in different ways. And I saw a bunch of children coming in who to sessions did not know how to play and were frozen because mm -hmm. they were afraid like don't move because if you move you you'll be a target and i thought wow i'm the person they're supposed to trust and but i get it they're afraid of adults and from that moment on i always thought about that as the core practice so even if you just get moving on paper you know with with a drawing instrument or a paintbrush that's movement i'm i'm very interested in that and thinking about how it's changed my life how much mm. better your body feels and totally i mean it's not just the exercise there's something else that happens it's just and that we need i don't you want to get back with people and dance with them oh yes my, right? <laughs> i've got an appointment i'm going to go to new york in another couple of weeks and i've got all these friends there they're just like we just have to go dance yeah we just have to go dance and I, i'm like on board yeah after we have the big <laughs> hug <laughs> Yeah. We're all vaccinated. I said we need to go. Yeah, I don't care where it is. And just just be together and just yeah. Just, I think I want to add a move counter to this episode and there you I'm go. put a little ticker on there every time you say move or movement. Yeah. I'm going to mm -hmm. see how many times we've said it this entire. Yeah, well, you see, I'm telling you, that's the that's the thing. If, if yeah. people feel, um, yeah, stuck, uh, anxious, and or even numb. Just start to move that by move it in the chair. Just put mm -hmm. on that music. I, yeah. I have two more questions because yeah. I think people may have connected with what you said in a couple different ways. Um, one, they may be listening and be like, oh my gosh, I would really love to work with an expressive arts therapist. With her. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, how might <laughs> How might someone um, who wants to work with an expressive arts therapist maybe find one? And then two, maybe there's a clinician that's listening that would like to incorporate expressive arts therapy practices into their clinical mm -hmm. practice. And how might they learn more about that? There's well, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we I have an institute. We do training. There are other institutes around the United States and then I think there are a few graduate programs that teach it. Uh, so, you know, that's one way, you know, I can give you that information for the website. But um, a lot of people, I think, are already trying to do it. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I think some of it's self-taught, uh, you know, and, and to a lot of clinicians, they, they have engaged in an art form. And they're just starting to make that connection that 
I, this is helping me. Maybe this could be useful in, in giving this also to the person who comes to see me for therapy. Uh, that's, I, I don't know if that answers that question. Uh, sure. More, and the other one was... How could, oh, how could someone find an expressive arts therapist to work with? That's a little bit more tricky. I mean, they can go on Google and, and look up expressive arts therapists, but they're more likely to find art therapists or music therapists uh, state by state, you know. I, but, you know, right now I was just thinking, I don't know how much this matters because we've <laughs> taken the boundaries off. with Telehealth. Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> telehealth and and uh they're starting to work on this reciprocal thing with people being able to serve other people across state lines hmm. so that's always gone on with the military so i think that's as interesting that now they're opening it up because sometimes people move and they've mm -hmm. seen a person that they like to work with and they move to another state why can't they keep seeing that person if they feel comfortable and they're getting what they need over this uh, kind of a format. So it's much easier to find, there's an International Expressive Arts Therapy uh, Association, mm. but it's a very small group. A lot mm. of people that are identifying or have skills in expressive arts therapy have not necessarily joined it because it's not yet a regulated profession. I kind of like that it isn't. <laughs> Regulation <laughs> brings a lot of other things, but art therapy, music therapy, dance movement therapy, they all have national organizations. Hmm. Um, so if you're interested in one of those, you can find that from those national organizations or state chapters. So Texas actually has for art therapy, two different state chapters. They have a Southern Texas and a Northern Texas. I don't know. San we're Antonio, large. you're in Southern. We're in Southern. <laughs> yeah, we're in South Texas for sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there are state chapters that can do that. But not everybody who is an art therapist may be comfortable with all these other integrative um, methods. If hmm. they've had training, they are. Hmm. Uh, so it just depends. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. What's that? We have um, kept you longer than we promised we would keep you so one you can edit out yes no not that at all it's not that now that we've talked too long i i would love uh for you to come back at some point and keep yeah. talking um how can people if they don't want to wait for the next episode that you're on how can people connect with you they can go to well they can go to my website there's the www.kathymalchiotti.com and I'm sure, you know, we'll have to look at how to spell the name. Sure, we'll, put it, we'll put it in our show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and our Trauma Institute is, well, it's www.trauma-informedpractice.com. Hmm. So their clinicians could link up and think about if they want to take a continuing ed course. So we have hmm. those running all the time. And that's been... I, I did not believe around last April that um, you could actually do experiential work and teach people a lot of this stuff over tel you know, telecommunication, so to speak, over a Zoom platform and was highly resistant to that. And we had to cancel a workshop in May, like everybody else had to cancel live events and had the first one uh, training that we would have done live and people were just, uh, they, they just hooked on. We, we just got so many people mm -hmm. saying, I can't believe how much I feel part of this community. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, we're on, we're like on the International Space Station. We're, <laughs> you know, we're, <laughs> we're all in these pods, right? And mm -hmm. but people felt connected. And I said, tell me about because we would spend an hour lecture an hour doing experience and then come back break out rooms and then do a big discussion how is it resonating with you how i'm giving you these prompts and helping you you know to experience some of these these practices they were just thrilled i mean they were really getting mm -hmm. it i mean what they were showing and describing so i have to say i got converted after that i still believe in a live audience but mm -hmm. It's been so accessible to people around the world. We have people in Mongolia. We have people in India. Mm. They could never come here, given the prices that people had to charge to rent a place, 
registration fee. They have to have would have to they never could access this. So mm. that's been a real miracle that there are people now on the other side of the world using these principles that never would have had the exposure. Oh, that's so cool. So I would rather be in a room with people, but you know, that has that just is gratifying to know that that has occurred. So that's so awesome. That's, where we took off because we were we were do, like everybody else doing live types of things. Very cool. As long as the audio is working and no one's screaming in your ear and your headphones oh, all as well. That. There's all that going on. <laughs> there's dogs barking. But I, yes. I think like it's kind of interesting. I'll be giving a PowerPoint and talking away and holding forth and somebody's dog is barking. <laughs> I don't know. I just yeah, I just say, hey, maybe you could turn off that mic for a bit. The dog's <laughs> distracting me. <laughs> I don't get upset about it. I mean, it just is what happens. I just yeah. think it's like humanity used to be, you get up to a podium in a big ballroom, and I'd be looking at the audience, and some people are talking to each other. They're looking at their cell phone while I'm working, you know, up there. <laughs> you know? It's so a this different is just, form of that. This is a little different, you know. They're yeah. in their own homes. And, well, the other thing you have to have patience around this. This is part of the trauma that we didn't even talk about. Parents having to homeschool mm. overnight, you know, and still work, or they were in a hybrid situation, you know. And so the day that they had class to come on our webinar, they, they had children at home. So, you know, and the mic flips on and off some, you know, all kinds of things happen. But I know it's pretty human in a way. That's the new humanity of this relationship through Zoom and these other platforms. Well, <laughs> so, we're so excited that we got to meet you and form start a relationship through telecommunications platform. And we're so grateful that you came and spent time with us let's, tonight. Um, let's do it again and talk about the arts and healthcare. Cause I have a long history in that. We never got to. Oh my gosh. I know we're it's, it's happening. Yeah. I know things about the arts and healthcare that, that the, the latest organization probably doesn't even know. Noah, you know, you're familiar with yes, Noah. Yes, yeah. we yeah. We're partnered with Noah that's for on this the, podcast. That's about the fifth iteration. <laughs> yes, I'm aware there's yeah. been a few different versions. Oh, yeah, versions. Goes way, way back. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I can't yeah. wait to hear all the juicy details. Next Maybe time we, we should have back. started that. Maybe we need to re-record this. <laughs> yeah, we need to go you back, have, and start you over. Have, like, the inside scoop. <laughs> you know what would, yeah, I, I have an idea about that because there's some people out there that have a huge history about the arts and healthcare that, um, you know, they've they've either moved or stepped back because they've mm. retired, but they're, they're, yeah, they have a, a, a really interesting perspectives. Yeah. Well, you give us a little list and we yes. will just uh -huh. work through it. Okay. Special edition. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. yes. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us and talking with us. And and it, you heard it here that she's coming back. She said it herself. Yeah. They were still recording. Well, now so, that we got this mic thing figured yes, out. Yes, we'll yeah. figure it out for next time. Make sure you go to our website, heartsandheart.org. Click on the podcast link. Make sure you're uh, subscribing wherever you're listening or watching. Keep creating, everyone. Thank you for listening. We will see you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to Arts for the Health of It, a podcast produced by Hearts Need Art, creative support for patients and caregivers, in partnership with the National Organization for Arts and Health. You can help others learn about the healing power of the arts by subscribing, sharing, and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen or watch. The podcast is hosted by Richard Wilmore, co-hosted by Constanza Rader, and produced by Ivan Briones. Our theme song, Songbird, is written and performed by Natalie Lane. Visit heartseedart.org to learn how you can support our mission to create joy with people facing life-altering health challenges. Join us next week to learn more ways you can create arts for the health of it. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Heartseed Art, their staff, board members, or other affiliates. All content is created for informational purposes only. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice or to diagnose and treat any health condition. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health professional with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you heard on this podcast.